Good evening and welcome to the State Representative Lamoille Washington Candidate Forum. This program is part of a series presented by The Bridge and Orca Media to help voters get to know their candidates better. I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Ann Charles. And I'm Linda Quinlan. And we're co-hosts of all things LGBTQ. And this evening's moderators, you may surmise. Um, these two are, in, these fora or forums are intended to provide candidates with the opportunity to share their views and to explain why they think they should be elected. It's not a debate, so they will not question each other. These forums are unique in that we have invited all candidates who are on the November 8 ballot, not just those from major parties. Before introducing the two candidates who are with us tonight, I'm briefly going to go over the format. Yes, sit back and relax. <laughs> we asked the public for questions in advance, and we have used them to help us develop a list of questions for the candidates. We did this along with input from the staff from the Bridge and Orca Media, as well as from your moderators tonight. During this program, we will also take call-in questions you can call ORCA at 802-224-9901. A volunteer will write them down, and then we will have them displayed on the screen in front of us. We will ask as many questions tonight as we can fit in. Candidates were not given the questions in advance. And each candidate has two minutes to introduce themselves, to explain why they are running, and to make opening remarks. After that, candidates will have a minute and a half to answer each question. And at the end, we'll get one minute for closing statements. The moderators have the discretion to make adjustments should any be needed. We have a timer in the studio that will help candidates keep track of how much time they have left. For their opening statements, we will call on the candidates in the same order they are listed on the ballot. After that, we will vary the order so that each candidate has the opportunity to go first, and so that they do not always go before and after the same person. When we introduce the candidates, we will give their names, their city and town they live in, and their party affiliation. It is up to them to expand on that. After that, we will call on the candidates by their first names. Tonight, the candidates have been invited are running for the Lamoille Washington House seat. This includes Elmore, Morristown, Stowe, Woodbury, and Worcester. This is a two-seat district. However, only one of the current incumbents is seeking re-election. Two of the four candidates on the ballot accepted the invitation to participate in this live forum. The other two candidates were extended an invitation to submit a two-minute recorded statement regarding their candidacy, but none was received. So, enough of us. Let's meet the candidates. In alphabetical order by last name, as you appear on the ballot, Sadia Lamott yes. from Morrisville. Yes. A Democrat? Yes. Avram Pat of Worcester, Vermont, formerly of Plainfield, also a Democrat, and Avram is the current incumbent. So welcome. And Sadia, if you would like to start with your opening remarks. Good evening, and thank you for having and hosting. My name is Sadia Lamont. I live in Morrisville, Vermont, and I am running for the open seat for the Lamoille, Washington District, as you all just stated. I'm running this currently this time at this point um, as a surprise to myself. I just recently graduated from Emerge Vermont um, in which we had a homework assignment and where I was learning how to run and I interviewed um, the former representative who see I'm running for, Dave Yacovoni, and I asked him, you know, do you think I should run for office and if so, which seat? And 
he supported my decision and <laughs> gave me his blessing. And here we are, and I am now running to serve as I've been serving in my community on a com community basis with different organizations and agencies in various capacities. And now it's time to take it to the next step. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, Avram, you, your Hi. opening statements. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Avram Pat. I, as was noted, I uh, am uh, the one incumbent among the four uh, candidates at, at, the, at this time around. Uh, I have uh, served three terms uh, in, in the Vermont House representing this district. I've had the privilege in my first term to serve with Shap Smith, who was speaker at the time, and with Dave Iacoboni, who has chosen not to run and who encouraged Saudi uh, uh, to run uh, for the seat. Um, so uh, I have uh, been involved in one way or another in uh, public affairs. At this time in the legislature, as people may know, there's a huge turnover of people who have left. Uh, I do think that in the, in the legislature, in order to get things done, we need a balance of new people, new ideas, fresh new blood, uh, and people with experience uh, who know how to get things done, who are willing to make compromises as, much, as painful as that sometimes can be uh, in order to get things done. Uh, and I have come from very strong principles and ideals imbued by my immigrant refugee parents, um, uh, but I, uh, I, I have the, I guess I have the temperament to work in, in the legislature when other people shouldn't try. <laughs> Thank you. And we want to start with you, Avram. What do you believe is the most important issue facing your district? If you are elected to the Vermont House, how will you use this role to improve your district? As time allows, how will you maintain contact with members of your district? I think ultimately, and this is a, this is a, a big issue at, in, that divides into many, many parts, but it's really uh, uh, the economy, um, the ability of people to make a living, uh, to pay for their housing, H housing and rental housing in particular in all of Lamoille County, not just our district, is, is, is really out of bounds right now. That's a statewide issue, but it's particularly hard in Lamoille County right now. Um, and, uh, and, and the services that are needed in order for people to do that, including um, affordable and available childcare. Uh, it, uh, so I think that is really, uh, people, uh, people are struggling, people want to work, uh, and, and, uh, and they, they, they can't make it, um, and, and, uh, and there are jobs open uh, everywhere, uh, but people are struggling to make that. So that, that's, the, that's the, the biggest issue, um, and, and I'm particularly interested and in have some background uh, in the housing issue from, from work I've done before I was in the legislature. And that's one that, that I think I can uh, add, add something to whether or not I end up on the committee that deals with, with that issue. Thank you. May you please repeat the question? Okay. What do you believe is the most important issue facing your district? If you are elected to the Vermont House, how will you use this role to improve your district? As time allows, how will you maintain contact with members of your district? Thank you. Okay, so I will agree and concur with, <laughs> with my dear friend Avram here. And I would, I would agree and say housing is a big issue and is one of the biggest issues in our community. Um, I've been serving on committees around housing for the past year, year and a half, um, and currently I'm working in partnership with housing, housing providers. I'm trying to be careful of the language that I use, not developers, <laughs> um, around the state um, with the Vermont uh, how, racial Justice Housing Jam. I'm the Lamoille County Liaison 
for that project. And so I've been working with them for the past six months or so on ways to improve housing and make sure that we're looking at different, all the different aspects of what we are doing and how we are doing it. And so I would then translate that work into what I'm doing when I'm serving, regardless, as Avram has said similarly, regardless of what committee I'm on, I've been doing these things and I will continue to do so and advocate for safe, affordable housing for all. Thank you. Starting with Saudia now. Yes. Election security and integrity has been an active discussion both nationally and here in Vermont. Do you believe the legislature should make changes to the election process? If so, what changes would you support? Can you repeat the second part of that question, please? Sure. Do you believe the legislature should make changes to the election process? If so, what changes would you support? Okay, thank you. Well, I know we've been looking at uh, the ranked voting system and, and considering having that done. I actually support that decision. I, I think it's, um, I've done a little bit of research and tried to follow it along. And I, I support ranked, ranked uh, voting systems. I don't know what that would look like in Vermont based off of our demographics and how people run and, the thing, and how it would affect us. But I think we should at least try it and be open to looking at different ways of exploring things. We've been doing things the same way for a long time. So you know, I'm open to, to trying a new system out. Um, also, I really appreciate the mail-in ballots being sent out. That has really improved. Uh, the voter outcome, and a lot of a lot of voters are now voting more. The numbers are increased than were previously because they have that access. So it's really improving access to voting to to voters, and so I think that that's something that should continue on. Great, thank you, Avram. Should I repeat the question? Yes, please. Election security and integrity has been an active discussion both nationally and here in Vermont. Do you believe the legislature should make changes to the election process? If so, what changes would you support? Okay. This is the first part of the question I needed to remember. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that there is a significant security and integrity issue in Vermont. I don't think there is in most of the country. Uh, but uh, I'm very familiar and, and and is very close up in Vermont. I was. Before I ran for office, I was on the Board of Civil Authority, first in, Wor in Worcester and previous to that in Plainfield, when we counted ballots by hand. Um, uh, and, and we sat across the table from people of the other party, and, and, and it worked. And so I, don't, I do not think that there is an issue. What can we do to improve uh, the process? I'm going to say two things. One. Um, uh, I, uh, I do agree wholeheartedly that the, the mail-in ballot system that we've developed, and, and I'm sure it can be tweaked some more, uh, but that uh, enables uh, and encourages people to vote who might not have thought about it or not made. I know people who something happens to them on election day and they can't make it to the polls by closing time. Um, and, and, and so that's an issue. The one thing that uh, um, ranked choice voting is something I'm interested in and I have not made up my mind. The thing that has been discussed over the years that I'm, I'm beginning to lean in favor of is the two-year term is a real hardship for um, statewide as well as legislative uh, uh, officials. Thank you. So since you're ready, Avram, okay. the next question. There have been recent events targeting Vermont's LGBTQ plus community. This has occurred both here in the state and on a national basis. These threats have included drag queen story hours being held at our local libraries, the vandalism of rainbow and transgender flags, and the targeting of transgender athletes in public schools. Would you support strengthening Vermont's bullying and bias hate crime statutes? Why or why not? Um, I, I am very aware of the, the, the increase in these incidents that you're talking about, and it's very troubling. And um, 
I, I would support I would support that. There is always, whether it's in this particular issue or others, there is always a line and a question uh, about when does free speech cross over into being a threat uh, or actual harm. Um, and so we, we always have to be careful with that because it, as much as we may um, despise what some people say, uh, at a certain point, they have the right to say that, and at a certain point, they've crossed the line. Um, and, and, and to the extent there are things we can do legally to better define that and, and say when, when that, wh where is that line, and you did it, and, and now there will be some, some form of uh, legal action around that. So yes, I support that. Thank you. Saria? Yes. So I work a lot with um, young people and youth in our communities. And as a queer Vermonter myself, I would absolutely support wholeheartedly any legislation that supports and backs all humans, regardless of how they choose to identify. And anything that stands against bullying and supporting the mental health of our Vermonters who have various marginalized backgrounds, including LGBTQ, right? Because it is hard. Life is hard on its own. The last thing we need are people making it more challenging. And so anything in my power that I could do, I will support and make sure that we keep Vermonters safe. Thank you, and thank you for your honesty and your disclosure on this show. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with Sadia. Mm -hmm. As a state, Vermont has the process of identifying and confronting systematic racism and its impact on our indigenous and communities of color. In Vermont, giving this issue the necessary attention and, if not, what actions, initiatives, would you support? Can you repeat the first part, please? Vermont has, the, has begun the process of identifying and confronting sy systematic, mm -hmm. systemic, I'm sorry, racism and its impact on indigenous and communities okay. of color. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was where I just wanted to make sure I was focusing on the right, right portion. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Right? It's, it's, it's so curious because I, I spend so many times in so many meetings with so many groups on so many committees doing a lot of this stuff. And Vermont is the leader. Vermont has been paving the way in so many aspects for so many things, which is why I love it, which is why it's home, which is why I stay here, right? And so I will continue to show up and do the work and support legislation that looks at the systemic racism that takes place. Because what happens is a lot of systems, people think the system is broken. And our system is not broken. Our system works just as it was created and intended to. However, our system was not created and intended to serve all people equally. So what we have to do is really look at who are the people in our community, who are we trying to serve, and how can we make sure there's equity in all aspects. And that is what I fully intend to do, continue to work on those systems and addressing the change as need be. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, um, it's important to talk about what we mean by the word systemic. <coughs> um, uh, we also talk about institutional. Um, uh, they're somewhat related. Um, and so this is not so much about you have a law that says you can't, uh, it's against the law to hate someone of color. Um, uh, uh, it's more about looking at our public and uh, institutions, our government, uh, policing and the, and the justice system, our education system and all of that, and seeing where intentionally or unintentionally uh, things like this happen so, so that biases are um, um, encouraged or not discouraged. Um, 
And uh, that is, uh, that's deeper work than simply just saying a, a law, this is, you know, th this is against the law. Because again, um, you, you can't regulate every behavior of, of, a, of a person, however reprehensible they may, may be. So we need to be doing things that change the structures, that change how uh, children in school um, what what they hear and and and, uh, and 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 that kind of stuff and 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 how our government uh, functions, including criminal justice and all of that, uh, um, uh, functions to avoid any kind of uh, bias. Sorry. Thank you, Avram. In response to the growing debate about reproductive rights, the Vermont Legislature completed the process to create Prop 5, Amendment 22, that would add reproductive freedom protections to the Vermont Constitution. Do you support this amendment? Why or why not? I do. As, uh, as you are aware, the process of bringing a, a, uh, an amendment to the, uh, to the public vote involves two separate bienniums, two-year sessions of the legislature. I happen to serve in both of those, I voted uh, yes in favor, and I have marked my ballot. I have not turned it in yet, but I, I will disclose it's a secret ballot, but I have voted in favor. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel very strongly uh, uh, about this, that this is uh, the, the circumstances uh, which cause uh, someone to uh, need an abortion uh, are very, very personal. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that is a matter for them to decide with the counsel of their, of their, of their doctor. Thank you. Saudia. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I encourage you all to vote yes as well on your ballots as they come in or when you do on November 8th. Yes, I support the uh, passing of the Reproductive Liberty Amendment because reproductive health care is health care. And it is not just about abortions. It is about so much more. It is about autonomy to people's bodies. It is about health care. It is about health access and keeping people alive and safe. So, yes. Thank you. So, Sadia, mm -hmm. th this question may sound familiar. Housing is a critical issue in Vermont. Mm -hmm. How should Vermont address the need for affordable and accessible housing and reconcile conflict, the conflict between development and environmental concerns. Yeah, a lot. Yes. <laughs> well, so it's, it's curious because that's where we've been, a lot of all other committees that we've been talking about, the affordable housing, short-term rentals, all of these things, our housing stock, what does that look like? And the environmental concerns. Right. However, for my group personally, the environmental concerns have just become a part of the conversation because I, it, it's, come, it's starting to come up. What are the effects? I'm meeting with VPIRG tomorrow to figure out. <laughs> Let's talk about this and have this conversation on what are the effects of overdevelopment of our communities and sprawl. What are the pros and cons? How can we effectively look at these outcomes and make change? It's a, big, it's a big task to do, and it will not be addressed in a biennium. It, it's something that you know, has been happening for a very long time. The amount of the rate at which houses are going up does not match the rate of number of people experiencing homelessness in our community right now, as well as our waiting list. So we can't really get ahead of it. Um, and so there's all these different aspects to look at. And I'm just continuing to work with the partners and sit at the tables and engage in the conversations and look at how we can address those things, right? So unfortunately, I don't have I don't have an answer on how to end you know, <laughs> housing, housing the housing crisis right now. However, we are working to address it in partnership and look at responsible development and amendment to Act 50. So I'll run. Yeah. In Vermont, we actually recognized this tension many, many years ago when we established something called the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, uh, recognizing that this one entity 
was going to be dealing both with environmental and land use issues and affordable housing. And, and, and I think they've done a good job at that, although it, the, the issue continues, uh, continues to arise. I happen to have two very close family members who have worked both on the housing and the conservation side in, in, in that agency, so I've heard about that. Um, the issue of uh, short-term rentals is a huge issue, it, it, more in some places like Lamoille County, uh, but it's, it's, it's an issue everywhere and we need to resolve that and find the balance between, we don't want to tell an individual homeowner who has an apartment over the garage that they can't make some money renting it out short term. We do not want developers buying up every property in town and turning it into short term rentals. Burlington has taken some steps around that that w I think we need, we need to look at. But uh, and the, the other thing is we need to continue funding uh, affordable housing programs, whether it's the Housing Finance Agency, Vermont Conservation Board, uh, and rent subsidies uh, and, and all of that. Thank you. Okay, starting with Av Avram. Gun-related violence is on the increase both nationally and here in Vermont. Should the Vermont legislature enact additional stronger gun measures if so, what measures would you support? I support, I start out by saying, as I've said many times over the years, that I have, I'm, I'm definitely not out in favor in, in, to take away people's uh, guns, to take away Vermonters' uh, right to have guns for um, hunting, um, for uh, uh, target practice, and for their own protection. Uh, the, uh, we, I, I am in favor of considering very careful steps to continue assuring that uh, guns do not get into the hands of people who, who are a threat either to themselves or, or to others, and also to consider um, when, we, when we talk about the Se United States Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, and we talk about originalism in the Constitution, what were arms back when that was written? Uh, they were not, you know, the kind of weapons that, that exist today um, are not what was even imagined then. So I do think that it's reasonable to consider some definition of what we mean by uh, uh, the type of arms that, that, that citizens can use as opposed to law enforcement or armed forces, you know, public safety uh, kind of uses. Thank you. Sadia. Yes, so as we experience so much crisis and unsafety, uh, especially with our children in schools and all of these things, I support common law and common sense uh, safety measures and any measures that help reduce gun violence. I don't believe that people should not have guns. I, you know, hunt, especially we live in Vermont. Hunting is a thing. That's people's livelihood. Some people, how they get their food. And so we're not trying to keep people hungry. We're just trying to keep people safe. And I think all of the measures that have been outlined and advocated for with in regards to safety, regards to wait lists for um, background checks, and all of those other types of measures to make sure that people who have guns are safe to have them, and when they have them, they are, they are storing them safely and securely so that we minimize access and reduce harm. Thank you. Thank you. Starting with Sonia. Mm -hmm. Current changes in extreme weather patterns are demonstrating the impacts of climate change. That's certainly uh, mm -hmm. clear. How specifically would the Vermont legislature respond to climate change? How should it respond to climate change, would you say? Take it very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, there's there are so many things that we are trying to do, 
And so here's the thing. Being an envi environmentalist is expensive. And I've, tried, and I've explained this to some of the environmental groups that, I, that I've been in communication with. And so when we're looking at redu reduction of single-use plastics, reduction of all of the things, recycling and all, et cetera, right, all of the things that will help save our environment and, and elongate the time, we have to look at the cost and people who have access to those things. And when, we're, when we look at the way things are made these days, it's really hard and challenging for people who experience poverty to have access to environmental friend, environmentally friendly solutions. And so I think it's not a one person thing. It's not in reducing people's carbon footprint is a help. But it's going to take something of significant magnitude for us to really make the changes we need to make. And so that is looking at creative solutions that really help access for everyone so that we can all play our part in saving our planet and reducing climate change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Avram. Uh, energy ended up being my field uh, that I worked in, and, I, and for the last two sessions, I served on the House Energy and Technology uh, Committee. Uh, but uh, for 16 years, uh, much to my surprise, I ended up being the CEO of an electric utility, a small one, but Washington Electric Co-op, which uh, pioneered first in energy efficiency and then in, in moving towards uh, renewable and cleaner energy sources. Um, and I also uh, worked in state government in the office that uh, uh, ran the statewide uh, low-income weatherization program. Um, so uh, the f first thing, very specifically, the legislature passed uh, uh, in the last session the Clean Heat Standard Bill. That came out of the committee um, uh, I, I, I was on. Um, uh, it failed to, it, it overrode, the Senate overrode the governor's veto, the House missed it by one vote. He was wrong in vetoing it, and one way or another we need to, we need to, bring, to bring that back because it, is, it contains the things that allow people to make, to make the choices when they need to make the choices, individuals and homeowners and businesses, to move away from uh, how they use energy now to other ways, and it allows businesses to change their business model, uh, including uh, energy providers like fuel dealers. So uh, that's that. That's where we need to start. Great, thank you. I want to encourage people who are watching this live. If you have questions, please call in eight zero two 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 four nine nine zero one. There are people standing by waiting to hear your questions. So Avram, the Vermont legislature has made several attempts to increase the minimum wage. Do you believe the minimum wage should be increased? And if so, by how much? And then if you could also comment on what you believe is a livable wage. Uh, yes, the, the minimum wage should be increased. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the number is and what the latest calculation of a livable wage is, okay. but uh, the, it, you know, it used to be uh, $15 and something. It's definitely higher than that now. Um, and the other thing that I always remind people of is it's one thing you pay people $15 an hour, but someone could be ma making $13 an hour but have really good health and retirement benefits, and they're doing a whole lot better than someone making 15 and nothing else. So it, 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 those things need to be uh, considered. But yes, um, we can see right now with the hardships that employers are having in, that, that, that large and small employers are paying starting wages much higher than they were a few years ago because they have to. Um, and I think we should, what the legislature should do is basically make that stick. Um. Okay, thank you. And, and you're just waiting to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, I, I was just going to lead with the, the livable wage as opposed to, to you okay. know, raising the minimum wage. We, we, everyone should have a livable wage and be able to afford to work. I know people who have to work three jobs and still can barely afford to pay for their heat or their 
you know, their bills. And that's unacceptable that someone has to work three jobs full time, you know, to be able to to live and, and to put that tax on their body. However, <laughs> so and um, raising Every, you know, our, our cost to a livable wage is also going to improve, increase the cost of everything else. And so it, it, there, again, there has to, we have to look at how do we build our economy in such a way that we have, we can provide a livable wage or benefits that, comp that supplement, right? Because that, that is a, a good factor. If someone has the be <coughs> benefits to supplement their wages, then that is extremely helpful. But however, um, livable wage and building our economy because the cost of everything else is going to rise at the same time. So if we just keep, we're just going to keep chasing everything. It's going to keep going in the same way. So we have to just really look at all the whole picture and all of the things. Okay. Okay, and kind of in the same line, Sadia, we have, would you describe the adequacy of health care services in Vermont and what legislative actions would you support to strengthen or improve them? The health, say the first part? The health care services in Vermont. I mean, do you think they're adequate? Do you think they need improvement? And, you know, what would you do to improve them? Well, that would depend on who you ask <laughs> <laughs> um, and what kind of coverage they have. So I think we can look at, um, I feel there, there are some options in Vermont that are serving people well. So depending on who you are, where you work, and what type of coverage you have, some people have adequate coverage in Vermont, and some people do not. And so I would look at filling the gaps and how can we get, look, look at making sure that everyone and all Vermonters have access to quality health care and affordable health care because some people cannot afford health care, some people cannot get to their appointments. And our systems, the way they're set up with, depending on which system you're looking at, it does not meet the needs and some they do. But I, I would, I know we're trying, I'm avoiding the question of the single payer health care system. I know that's where y'all are going. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have a quick addendum to that, which is the administration has proposed a process to privatize a portion of state pension plan by moving retirees from inclusion in the currently negotiated health care plan to private Medicare Advantage plans. Would you support such a move? I am not aware of that, so I would have to see what that looks like. But I support pension plans that support our workers and making sure they have the benefits that they need. So I don't, I don't know what that, um, I would have to look at that and see what it looked like before I agreed to support it. If it's something that benefits them, then yes, I will. And if it's something that takes away from what they are trying to obtain, then absolutely not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll answer the first part of the question and then the, the, the second one. Um, the, the issue in Vermont uh, is, uh, is how we pay for it. It's not whether services, good services are available. I think by and large, I'm sure there are gaps uh, and maybe in different parts of the state. I know people have trouble getting to, uh, dental care because of availability. Um, uh, but the real issue is, is how we pay for it. I am ultimately a supporter of uh, uh, single payer or what's been called Medicare for all. My father, who was a, a family doctor in, in the old days, uh, got himself in trouble for, for supporting uh, Medicare when it was first proposed because he thought it should, three years later, it should just roll out to everybody. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, that's very difficult for Vermont to do on its own, and that's a large reason why uh, you, you can't, I mean, even, even the health care providers in some parts of the state, most people go to Dartmouth-Hitchcock in another state for their services. Um, and in other parts of the, in New, New York, people go to Burlington for health care services. So it's difficult to do uh, one small state. Um, uh, uh, but that's the direction we, we need to go. We need to go to. Um, uh, in terms of the specific proposal, I happen to be th that is targeted at uh, 
uh, retired state employees. Right. I happen to be one. <laughs> um, so this, if I, I'm, I'm looking at this as both a, legislature, a, a legislator and as someone who receives those benefits. Um, I have a lot of problems with it. It is said that it saves money and it, it, it costs. There are lots of stories about it also raises some out-of-pocket costs for the participants. But mostly on the 8th of this month, the New York Times published a truly shock, shocking story about the major health care providers and how they have screwed the government by overcharging mm -hmm. um, in, these, um, uh, in these types of uh, Medicare, they're called Medicare Advantage programs. And um, I, I prefer uh, sticking with the old-fashioned Medicaid, the Medicare, there was nothing wrong with it. It, was, it had lower administrative costs than every, anything else. And the, attempt, the, the move to go to Medicare Advantage was, in fact, politically an attempt to unravel the Medicare program when it was first created. So uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm watching this very carefully, but I have a lot of concerns about it. Thank you. Back to Avram. I'm really intrigued by the concept of citizen legislators here in Vermont which translate to me is you're all making very low salaries. Critics have suggested that that kind of eliminates the people who are even able to run uh, because it's a very time consuming job. What is your response to the question of citizen voting? Citizen. So, I'm sorry, citizen legislating okay. and citizen legislatures. Um, I, I I do say, and I, I responded to this in, an, in another, uh, um, uh, it, when asked at another forum about, about this, we say we have a citizen legislature, we like to think we do. Um, really, it, what happens is that not everybody, but a very large number of the legislators, legislators happen to be retired, like I am, or happen to have businesses or jobs that allow them uh, to take the time off uh, from, from their jobs. But it is not a full-time job. We only get paid for the days when the legislature is in session, period. Um, and expense reimbursement and, and all that. But a very large number of younger um, uh, people have been elected in recent years, uh, the last two election cycles in particular. And a very large number of them this year have chosen not to run again because they can't make it. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, that's an issue, and I do think I do support. I don't think we want to go to a full-time uh, legislature in Vermont. I don't think we need to in terms of the amount of time. But do people need to be compensated better uh, for this, and do they need to be compensated some for all of the work they put in year-round? Yes, I think I think we need to. Take a real look at that. Thank you, Saudia. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> not having been in, in this position, um, it's very curious for me. And so, I I, I want to speak to a couple of things. So, it's they say it's a citizen legislature, which is why I'm running, right? And I do support uh, making the pay available because I know some representatives who are not running for re-election this year because they could not afford to run for re-election. I would like to be clear and state that I cannot afford to run and serve, right? However, I am doing it, right? I am trusting, I am trusting in our system and our community to make sure that as a, per, as a citizen who is running to serve our community, that I will be okay, right? And so I'm, I do support, I don't know if you would say increase of pay because I don't know how that works considering they only get paid for the days they're in the legislature right and then there's the benefits losing health care all of the other things that are not in, that are not you know considered I've I support having access to those things because I will need those things I don't know how it's going to happen so do I support it yes but I'm, I'm running on faith on faith out of our systems and faith of our communities, and I'm hoping we can figure out a way to make it work. Great, thank Maybe you. Maybe I'll be the example, right? <laughs> so, just, add, yes. just very briefly, just <coughs> information-wise, 
legislators get paid a per diem, a, a flat amount for every, and, and they get paid for mileage. They get a flat meal allowance yep. for every day that they're, that they're working. And for those that need to be have housing in, in, in Montpelier, uh, they get a, a, a housing allowance. There, there's no other benefits uh, that, are, that are paid to the legislators. But holding on to that benefit theme, Sadia, the legislature in Vermont has made several attempts to pass paid family and medical leave. Mm -hmm. And it was the last attempt was vetoed. Would you support another effort for paid family leave? And if so, for what length of time? Ooh, I know. Yes, absolutely. Just, just when you thought you knew the question. I, I know, <laughs> right? I was like, oh, I can answer this one. <laughs> um, yes, I, I absolutely support um, paid family leave. And I think it should be determinant upon the business for which it is and the factors of what you're looking at. When we know what the pandemic has shown us is that some families required more time based off of sickness and childcare and other things. And, and we had the, the family um, care that supplemented that during that time. So if we learned anything during that time, it's that we need to have more paid family leave. As, and I'm not saying, and I, I'm trying to steer away from terms around uh, maternity leave or paternity leave, right? And I'm trying to consider all aspects um, of health care that we need. And so it, it's a matter of health and safety and making sure families can be okay to be able to be okay so that they can still go back to work and be ready to provide and be citizens and communicate and do what needs to be done. Alvaro? Uh, the answer is yes. I voted for it in the past. In terms of the, uh, the question of like how long, how many days, months, weeks, whatever, I was not on a committee that, that, that dealt with that. We, I was on, you know, on the receiving end of, of the outcome of their process which was involved huge amounts of controversy, well, disagreement um, uh, about people who were pointing to the need um, and people who were saying that's too much because that, you know, we can't afford it. It could be subject to abuse, which it could be, um, and, and all of that. So I don't, I don't have a magic answer for how many days. And what Saudi has said is correct. We're not just talking about maternity, paternity, uh, we're talking right. about the need to care for a family member and all of that. And those, as I think about it, those could be different amounts of time, at least in theory. How do you roll that into a program that is actually fair, not subject to abuse? Um, that, that's what the committee wrestled with. But they came up with something that the majority of people in the committees agreed in, and I voted for it, knowing that, that it, it's never a perfect answer. Thank you for your answer and thank you for your vote. Yeah. Abram, yeah. what is the most important issue for the legislature coming up and what actions would you support? One issue, huh? Um, well, no <laughs> issues. What? Um, I do think, and again, this is this, these are when you're talking about big, try to describe a big issue. It's not something that you can write one bill about um, and 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 say this is the bill that's going to solve solve this. Um, uh, but I, to me, there are there are two huge issues. One in the in the big definition of it, in which I answered earlier, is is the economy, uh, the ability. Of people to actually make it, and that that involves all of us as individuals, as well as businesses, small businesses, and large businesses. We don't want large businesses leaving that employ lots of people. Um, uh, the other thing, uh, personally, uh, is uh, is uh, climate change because that is uh, it's already overwhelming us, and it is costing us. Uh, it's costing us all all the time in our town and state budgets roads and everything else that's costing individuals not as badly as in some other places in, in, in the country yet, uh, but, but it is happening and we need to uh, 
uh, take steps to help people make the changes. Um, uh, it's not that we're, everybody must uh, get <coughs> rid of their uh, uh, oil burners and their furnaces uh, tomorrow, uh, but when that boiler needs replacement, then they need help making the right choice. That just happened to me this past year. Um, uh, so uh, went from a cordwood boiler to a pellet boiler um, because the, po the, the cordwood boiler blew, so I had to do something. That's when, and I got help. I got, I got public uh, help that's available from various programs for doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs> <I don't laughs> there, there are so many important issues, and I, um, it's really challenging to pick one because intersectionality is real. And everything is intertwined, everything is connected, everything is dependent upon something else, right? And so when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about economic development. We're talking about the ability to be able to afford those things. When we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about be, the ability to be able to afford those things. How do we pay for it? And so I think the creativity around how money is spent in our state will be a big issue. So I think economic, I would say economics is, is, is going to be a big issue in the legislature as we are looking at all these new things that are happening. And I think that's going to drive a lot of what happens. Uh, for me personally, I'm going to have to say that um, just really making sure that we're looking at all the bills and every piece of legislation that is put forth is done equitably and responsibly is important to me. And so I'm really hoping that we start to use the probing questions to look at things in the legislature as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. This is our last question before we ask you for closing statements and it's a really broad one. <laughs> what questions would you, what question would you have liked us to ask that we haven't? What would you like us to consider? Chandra. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Sadia, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. I'm thinking, um, uh, that caught me off guard. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's our role. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can move on. Okay, uh, let's say. Uh, I, um, I do think uh, the 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 uh, the issue that I struggle with as a legislator, uh, and I've kind of alluded to this, uh, is how to you know um, is to how to look at things completely holistically um, when at the same time the only thing we can do is uh, pass changes in, in this section of statute or that section of statute or add a new section of statute or propose a constitutional amendment, um, uh, none of which are, um, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about um, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in institutional racism earlier. The issue is much bigger than that, and it and it involves not just the people, the the, the classes of people that were mentioned in the, in the question. Uh, it ultimately involves ultimately involves uh, involves uh, everybody, um, and so uh, it's just how it's very difficult. Uh, the part of the frustration and why some people shouldn't try. Um, it, by running for the legislature is that uh, that what we can do is limited by um, uh, having uh, asking a lawyer for, who works for the legislature to uh, come up with language that would do a particular thing and and then and then we argue about that and either it either passes or it doesn't so it, it's really how how do we keep a much more a, a bigger picture uh, view of things and now we just have as time political, for closing as political comments. people. Saudi has had a chance to gather her thoughts, if yes, she may, Saudi. if she wishes. 
No, that's that's okay. I I welcome all questions, you know, <laughs> and I do I do. And so it's really what I explain to people when when we have these things, it's it's really for me. I I'm a part of so many different organizations as I stated before and I do so much work in my community that for me my brain is is always focused on something different and always on the next thing so I enjoy when people ask questions because it helps me focus on that one specific topic at that moment in time but everything is all interconnected and so I welcome all questions and I'm so glad that you asked the questions you did so thank you I appreciate thank you. the questions you did ask. thank you so now you each will have a minute for a closing comment I will tell the people who are watching that both of you have websites mm -hmm. so if they would like more information or to become more involved in your candidacy they could refer to that mm -hmm. so Avram the uh, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me talking about the legislature I could never do that and I, what I say to them is, well, then don't. Um, if you care about issues, uh, and that's usually what it's about, there are lots of ways to work on those issues without running uh, for, for the legislature. You have to have the temperament, um, as I said earlier, um, to uh, it, it's sometimes called making sausage or whatever. Uh, sometimes you work on something all year long, it goes up in flames in the last week, it comes around again. Um, and so um, uh, that's one thing I offer is, is that temperament. And I have the experience both in my work and now in three terms in the legislature um, to figure out how to find common ground with people uh, who disagree with and to get things done, to really get things done. Thank you. Sadia? Thank you. Well, my parting words are, I have not been a legislator. However, I'm very much forward looking forward to being one and learning all the things along the way and doing the best that I possibly can do. You can join my campaign, learn more about me at LamontForVermont.com, Lamont for Vermont on all social media platforms, and reach out and call my business. Uh, my phone number can be found on my website and all of those things. I'm really looking forward to continuing to connect with people in the communities because this is about you. I'm running to serve you and be a voice for you, so please let me know your issues. Let me know what's important to you and how I can best help and serve you in the legislature and the state house. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you to both of our candidates. Thank you. Thank you for moderating with me. <laughs> and thank you for watching.